This is a picture of a forest in Connecticut today. But 15,000 years ago, uh, this is what Connecticut looked like. How was our habitat able to change so much? And what will Connecticut look like in the future? Well, those are questions we're going to explore in this video on ecosystem dynamics. Let's start with the process that makes ecosystems change over time. This is called succession. And it's called succession because it basically consists of a series of stages that change the ecosystem over time. So here we can see the first stage. And what happens is that this first stage of organisms and abiotic factors change the ecosystem and make it possible for a new set of organisms to live in the ecosystem. And then those organisms change the ecosystem and they make it possible for a new group of organisms to live in the ecosystem. And then they change the ecosystem, making it possible for another group of organisms to live in the ecosystem. And then finally, we arrive at our climax community, uh, which is the stable community in an ecosystem. So it's key to note that species in an earlier stage are replaced by species in a later stage. And those species, as they are being replaced, they're able to do so because the earlier species made the community better. So there are two types of succession. The first one is called primary succession. And this occurs when there is basically nothing in the ecosystem but bare rock. And this may happen after a glacier retreat in the case of Connecticut. There is no soil and there's basically no life, maybe a few bacteria, but that's about it. What happens next is that pioneer organisms will move into the area. They're called pioneers because they're the first organisms to colonize the habitat. And these are generally very simple organisms like moss, a simple plant, and lichen, which is a symbiotic organism uh, consisting of some algae and some fungus. So they will move into the area, and when they die and decomposers break down their dead materials, uh, they'll turn into simple soil. And this makes the community better for some new organisms, like grasses and small plants. Now that there's some soil, these guys can survive. And when the grass and the small plants die, again, the decomposers will convert their materials into inorganic nitrogen and phosphate, adding it to the soil, making the soil richer for the next group of organisms, which will be shrubs. So the shrubs will grow. They'll add nutrients as well to the soil when they die. And then finally, we arrive at our climax community. This is the stable, diverse, complex community. And this is only possible because all of the earlier stages kept making the soil and the habitat better for these complex organisms. And even though it's not shown here, there would also be animals and other organisms that depend on the plants. So a couple key things to note. This pioneer group is a very simple, and low diversity community. And their niche is very wide because there isn't a lot of competition. In this climax community though, because there's so much diversity, each species has a pretty narrow niche in which to survive in. Now this is a little bit different from secondary succession. What happens in secondary succession is similar. We have uh, increasingly complex organisms moving into the community, but we don't start off with bare rock we start off with soil. And because of that, secondary succession is faster because it takes a while to turn rock into soil. So because this is starting off with soil, there can be some plants initially and it won't take quite as long to get to our climax community. Now, what can cause succession? Well, disturbances can lead to succession. And disturbances are just events that alter ecosystems and change resource availability. These are some common examples of disturbance. And remember that these can include human activity as well. And if they're severe enough, they can wipe out most of the community and then lead to succession. However, it's important to note that disturbance can be good for ecosystems. If you look at this graph, we're comparing the intensity of the disturbance to the number of different species in the community. And when there's very little disturbance, 
the species diversity is quite low, which isn't good. This isn't a, a complex, stable community. When the intensity of the disturbance is intermediate or moderate, there are a lot of species in the community, and that's a good thing. Of course, if we have really severe disturbances, that can remove most of the species, uh, and that will decrease diversity and perhaps lead to succession. Now let's take a look at some other biotic factors that can affect an ecosystem's dynamics. One is the dominant species. Now dominant can have different meanings in different contexts, but within ecology, dominant refers to the species that is most abundant or most numerous. And this is often, in a terrestrial ecosystem, a producer. And it has a large impact on other species. <clears throat> Another important type of species is a keystone species. In this diagram, think of each block as a different species in an ecosystem. This would be the keystone species. As you can see, it's not necessarily the most abundant, the most numerous species, but if we remove the keystone species, the whole community falls apart. So this is a species whose impact is really great, even though its biomass or its abundance is not. And this is often a top predator uh, that controls herbivore populations. Let's take a look at an example. <clears throat> this starfish is an example of a keystone species. It's a top predator, uh, not the very top, but it is a carnivore, and it consumes mussels. Now, if we look at the food web for this ecosystem, here's our starfish. And the starfish is the only predator that consumes mussels and limpets. So if we remove the starfish, the limpet population and the mussel population are going to boom. And that's going to deplete the producers in the ecosystem. These mussels and limpets are going to eat up all the plankton, algae, and seaweed, also probably outcompete the crabs, and that could lead to the whole ecosystem collapsing. We're going to end our video on a down note by talking about invasive species. These are just what they sound like. These are species that have invaded an area. They're not native and they're usually brought to the area by humans. And oftentimes these species will have adaptations that allow them to outcompete the native species. And this can lead to a lot of local extinctions. And in class, we'll take a look at several examples of invasive species and their effect on ecosystem dynamics. <clears throat>